Yeah. Your best friend yourself. We're on. We're live. We are. We're together from far away. How are you both? Good. good. You know, good. <laughs> you In a wonderful. house together. Right. With our uh, with our with our angle of our camera turned upwards so that everything is aimed at the <laughs> at our neck wrinkles. Yeah. <laughs> So are you still, you're still working right now, Jessica? I am, I am. Um, we've, Helen Woodward, you know, it's considered one of the essential services because we are actually saving lives and bringing animals from uh, Louisiana, uh, from Galveston, from kind of hotspot areas where the shelters are not allowed to stay open. So we literally have dogs arriving that would have been euthanized and are the most beautiful, amazing, incredible puppies. And they're in transport vehicles with letters driven by the drivers basically saying that they have to come through or the animals will be euthanized. And they're showing up over at Helen Woodward and got everybody out there in their protective gear and taking those animals out of that van and getting them immediately into baths and into medical and getting them into foster homes. And then um, our adoptions are by appointment only. Um, so you do, uh, you have to do your um, applications and interviews over the phone and, and uh, web page. And then one, you get one hour on one day to come in and see three animals. But I'm happy to say that our adoptions are amazing we have an 85 percent wow. adoption rate so wow. the animals that do come in are going right out the door and into loving homes so it's been amazing do you see the adoptions are up right now because people are at home and they want to Yes. Yeah. So, you know, the thing is our, our normal adoption rate just on any given day, if, if a group of people came in, would probably be a, on a really good day. It's about 65%. Uh, right now we're seeing about 85% of the people that come in adopt. But oh. the other thing that's different is that when things were normal at Helen Woodward, anybody could wander in. I could on a whim come wandering in and look at the animals. Um, the people that are coming in have made appointments, filled out applications, done phone uh, interviews. So they're really wanting to get a pet. So that's the other thing that we're seeing. We're seeing that the people that come in have really thought about it. It's not kind of an, you know, a gut thing where they're just running in to see if they can get a pet. They've really waited and really want an animal. So it's been, it's been lovely. It's been doing my heart a lot of good. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. What about you, Fran? What are you up to? Nothing. Absolutely. <laughs> no, no. I, uh, I, uh, I'm teaching through, um, you know, video conferencing and, uh, and, you know, trying to figure out um, the um, upcoming forever postponed uh, season, like, like everybody as far as um, theater goes and um, really loving actually uh, time with um, Jess and the animals and uh, can't wait to, you know, when we can all sort of leave our homes and, uh, you know, meet in person. Um, Cause uh, haven't seen many people. Um, Just me. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> um, so, it, but, but, you know, hanging in, I can't complain at all. And, and I'm sort of a loner anyway. So um, I, um, this is sort of like, you know, situation normal AFU. Uh, yeah. Yeah. How about you? Um, <laughs> I mean, the... interviewing people. Yeah. How does it look like? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, finding routine has been difficult, but especially when they took like parks and beaches away, I was like, right. oh man. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, going on walks and just kind of doing stuff that I always said I was going to do. That's great. Like just things like the artist way and you know, wow. oh, now I have time to do it. And, mm -hmm. and so, uh, you know, you, I, I've written a novel. <laughs> <laughs> I built a car. Yeah. Yeah, I learned how to build a car. Yeah, we just did, she just hit the backyard while I was writing my novel. So, yeah, there, do you feel though? I feel like some people do. Like, they, like there's this pressure as a creative to be like, "Oh, well, you're gonna write the great novel after this." Yeah, I, I know. I wrote yeah. Catcher in the Rye. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I I think that um, I I do think that everybody has, no matter what line of um, occupation you're in or passion or 
you know, devotion that you're, um, it has been your habit that you feel like this, this need to um, somehow keep doing exactly what you were doing or be even more productive. And um, I find myself um, sitting back and watching and maybe listening um, to things develop. Like, I don't mean that I'm doing anything purposefully. I, I really mean like out of my sort of boredom with myself, because that's the other thing is I never realized how much I don't really like myself. So I'm hanging out with myself. No, I don't mean that in a, I don't mean that in a bad way, but it's my like, every day. This is my every day. <laughs> but it's like, it's, it's, it's like, it, you know, it's, 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 um, it, it was one thing when it was a, when it was a choice, when I was like, by, like I said, I was a loner and I'm like, when it was my choice, I was cool with it. But now like, it's like the government is telling me, no, now you have to deal with yourself. I'm like, you know, <laughs> but uh, the, um, but I think, I think that just, um, it's, it's been a great time to just, um, sit back and um, you know, watch other people and, uh, and, and observe the neighbor's habits. <laughs> like that's curious, you know, normally we're not home when most of them are home and truly our next door neighbor, Paul, he's like, I don't know, it's like that Tom Waits song. It's like, what the hell is he building in there? Oh, yeah. when this guy's tools are constantly going. I'm like, what the hell? Um, Doing and then, more than us. Yeah, and then right next door, they like redesigned their backyard and they have like this, this wonderful movie screen. Yeah, they've got like these uh, Italian lights. Yeah, they've got they've got a golf thing out there. Like the, their whole it's like a, it's it's amazing. Yeah, what happened? It's yeah. like it's like all these. We've got puddles. Yeah, we've got puddles. We've got dog crap. <laughs> We're like you know, <laughs> it's 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 really you know. I just have to you know walk outside and you know make sure the koi pond the fish are not dead. You know, like I'm like, hey guys, <laughs> good, hang in there. But anyway. People are calling you a creeper right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Any publicity is good publicity. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> right, right. Why don't, why don't you tell us a little, uh, um, tell us a, about your creative journey, both of you, like how you got to where you are now. Oh, well, we got to where we are now. Uh, yeah, I know. I mean, I'm, you know, God, that sounds Peter so, Pan. no, no, no. Well, yeah, I mean, when I was a kid, I literally did put on plays in the backyard, probably like every mm -hmm. actor. I mean, literally, I just found an old picture that I, I posted to our latest email of I had done a wrote a production of uh, It's a Great Pumpkin, Charlie Brown. And I played Lucy and my sister was Linus. And we charged the kids in the neighborhood a nickel to come and watch and they came through <laughs> the back fence. So um, we were always throwing shows. And so it was always something that when um, I my really close girlfriend Lauren and I were in an acting class together and we went and saw a terrible performance um, that I that will remain nameless and we looked at each other and said oh I think we could do this <laughs> if any old person could do it put on these so we just started trying it and at the time we were friends with Darren Scott and oh. um, Amanda Sitton slash Wallace and all these wonderfully talented people. And so we just started putting on plays with them. And at the time it was a for-profit business. We didn't have a nonprofit. It was just me and Lauren just spending our money to rent theaters and just hire our friends to act. And, mm -hmm. um, and, then, and then eventually, you know, we started our theater company years later and yeah. kind of took backyard productions and turn it into backyard renaissance but you have a much more interesting story than i do. i don't really you i really do, no no i don't i don't i the, the, the thing that embarrassingly comes to mind is you know it's like what's your journey and the most vivid, vivid memory i have is being um i don't know how old i was but I was, I was i was i was fairly young but it was somewhere around junior high and um they, I, i'm gonna go into way too much detail but what the hell right we're in quarantine <laughs> the uh is that i uh, I remember, I I'm editing so much right now. I was I was on a seated surface. <laughs> Let me just put it that way. I was on a seated surface, and I it just came to me that I wanted to be on the Johnny Carson show. Like I just thought that that would be the absolute. And I'm like, how do people get on the Johnny Carson show? And um, I realized I've that, never heard this story. I know she hasn't because it's too embarrassing to admit. <laughs> But things have changed in the last 21 days, and uh, we'll get to know yeah, right. I know uh, um, the and uh, and the people that I was admiring were um, all sorts of storytellers, and they were the ones who were highlighted on the Johnny Carson show, right? And um, anyway, my journey didn't take me there. Obviously, just 
you know, spoiler alert, I never made it to the Johnny Carson show. <laughs> um, but then I just um, finally in, you know, in college, um, thought that uh, I would give it a shot. To, and I took an acting class. And uh, the first day scared the hell out of me. So I left and I didn't go back until the next semester because my roommate dared me to um, with words that I won't go into because, you know, it's the way some guys talk to each other when they're trying to, you know, encourage, quote unquote, their friend to do something. And, um, and then I just, and I just fell in love with it. I just, it was just a matter of how can I keep doing this? Um, and then things unfolded from, from there. And, and I think the other thing is, you know, um, I think one of the things that Jess and I have in common with a lot of people, whether it be, you know, uh, you or, Sean or Bill or anybody um, is that uh, you come to a point where you realize or you whether it's well you just realize that it's sort of a do-it-yourself thing that nobody is you get to the point where suddenly you realize people aren't hiring me and so the only person who's going to employ me is me and how do I go about doing that and um, and they and and then I just you know I, I with each day I really do fall in love with uh, stories and storytellers and people who um, find a new way to tell a story. Yeah. I, I also think that um, it's not just about, well, nobody's gonna hire me. It's, uh, I think Fran and I both have people we love to work with. We love watching those people. We enjoy having them in our space, whether it's to have a piece of pizza or because we think that they have an amazing voice or because we like, you know, how they interpret a character. So how fun to have an opportunity to invite those people and say, you want to play with us. And so I yeah. think a lot of what we've really focused on in the last, you know, very short few years of our having our company is, you know, who are those people out there that we just have a blast with and can we create mm -hmm. something together? And I think mm -hmm. that's really been an enjoyable part of what we've been trying to do. Yeah. 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 And I, yeah, I'm just amazed that anybody wants to sit in the same room with me sometimes, <laughs> you know, you, you, because you're like, like I've been with myself for 21 straight days. So now I know like the truth is being revealed, but no, it's, 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 um, it is really, I think that's also a thing that is neat is when you, there's that weird thing, no matter what you're doing, where you have a kinesthetic, what I call a kinesthetic response, because it's not just intellectual, it's something within your whole body where you're like, like you've had this, I'm sure, where you're, where you're, where you're, you know, directing a play and you'll say one word and you'll see the actor's eyes light up. Like you don't even have to complete the thought. Mm -hmm. And that's such a great feeling. It's, it's um, so that, that when you get into a room where there are people who are all saying, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, that's exciting, it's intoxicating, and it can even take you through those days where it feels like everybody in the room is saying, nah, nah, dumb idea, nah, I can't do that. You know, it's just that all you need is, it's like, I guess, you know, that given my addictive personality, I just need one hit and it keeps me going for like a long time. Right? <laughs> that is that is true. I think I, I always tell like actors that ask questions like, oh, how do we get, how do we get the job? And I'm always like, you know, a big part of it is can I let this person infiltrate my subconscious? Because whether yeah. you like it or not, you're going to be in my dream life. I'm going to be <laughs> hanging out with you. So we better be good friends, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Be able to. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. And that's like, you know, that's it. And I think it's a hard thing to get over because I just think in life, like I go to the Vons and I don't talk to anybody, you know, and if somebody does, you know, if somebody does talk to me, yeah. if I'm like by the grapefruit and somebody in the Vons is like, hey, how you doing? I'm like, oh, God, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I leave. So I think that, that that's one of the things that, 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 is, that is so challenging is that um, we, we, it, it's, it's, so, it's so hard to permit ourselves and then publicly to be given permission to be able to have a good time with somebody. <laughs> Did you see what Tom said? I what did Tom say? I just popped in to tell Fran to love himself. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Tom. <laughs> yeah, it's it, yeah, but it is. Uh, that's a really good point. Is that is that is that is that you know those people that you um, gravitate towards? They do just you know infect your um, your subconscious, like you said. It's so true. Do you? Um, you know, a lot of people don't know that you both worked at Signet, like in the oh, yeah. side of things. 
Yeah, I had worked in radio for 14 years and performed at Signet for, I think I did eight shows there and some of the happiest shows I've ever done. I really loved doing shows there. And um, then when radio just started getting terrible and uh, I needed to bow out of it, I was very fortunate to get to work with Sean and Bill right when they moved. It's at the same time Fran did, right when they moved over to the Old Town space. And I was the outreach director there for a while. And I credit that job with teaching me everything. And I credit Manny Fernandez too, with teaching me everything I needed to know about writing press releases. And it really served serves me today in what I do with the rescue of animals. So um, that was a, a, a lovely time and uh, also led to uh, saving animals. So I'm uh, happy about that. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I was, Jessica uh, said uh, during the same time I, w I became the Associate Artistic Director, the position that uh, you hold now. Mm -hmm. And um, that was during the transition from um, the theater on uh, El Cajon Boulevard to uh, Old Town, um, and the same thing. It just it was a it was a a wonderful whirlwind um, baptism by fire of um, learning um, all sorts of stuff, and 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 not even having to engage that stuff directly, but to be able to witness it directly. What um, whether it was Manny or Bill or Sean or Veronica or and, and then uh, Jason Heil was there at the time. Um, as well, and witnessing all the different tasks and responsibilities that people had, um, which I think informs, what's great about that is I think it informs um, any job that you take, whether you're actor, director, designer, producer, whatever uh, hand you're gonna play in getting a show up on its feet, is that, you, um, is that you realize, boy, there are a lot of people, depending on me, doing my part and doing it responsibly and doing it efficiently and 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 that it can't when I say doing my part I think oh God, I hate to admit this but I think there's that phase that some of us I'll name me go through where you know um, you're a little wet behind the ears and you think that um, it's um, all I need to do is concentrate on this one little thing that I do and then everything's gonna take flight and not realizing that oh no maybe it isn't about me maybe I <laughs> maybe I need to step aside and you know let the um, let the needs of the overall organization um, uh, step out in front. And like a play. Like a play. Like a play. Like the, how you can't be focused just on your own character. Right. You have to be focused on the entire story that's being told. Because if you get too focused on, well, this is what my character is going through, but it doesn't tell the story, then it doesn't serve the story. Right. Right. So everything See comes. See how I it? He's that, a full this circle. Is so <laughs> Quarantine. <laughs> Quarantine together. <laughs> Let's rub noses. <laughs> what um so so are you doing anything? Are you finding yourself doing except for Fran um spying on the neighbors? Right. Are you are you finding yourself like, oh I'm learning how to cook right now or I'm I'm reading all these books I wanted to read. Anything I was gonna say that's, that's something that's kind of interesting and I don't know if other theater people are going through this, but I'm finding that I'm very focused on other types of art, not myself doing them, but I've been watching so many movies that I've always wanted to see that I just never have time to because we're usually in re rehearsal or production or I'm working with the animals or whatever. So I haven't had time to sit and watch some of these beautiful performances things like honey boy we watched the other night with Shia LaBeouf which is beautiful um and that peanut butter falcon is another one that he did that just these incredible performances reading books by writers that I absolutely adore um looking at uh, the creative work that's being done uh, on social media by the really talented people that like uh, know how to do social media. I mean, that's the, what they do. They create content. Um, so, you know, I'm just enjoying seeing how people, how art continues to thrive um, in at a time when uh, it's hard for theater. And I, I do think that, that the thing I find challenging is that I think that theater really and i send my love and heart to everybody who's trying to create something right now as a theater artist 
but theater is part of the art is the audience and the and the actors and together with this production you created so i'm finding myself a little bit removing myself from that right now because i think it's a little heartbreaking to me right now and i know it's going to all come back around so i'm enjoying seeing the stuff that doesn't require an audience to be there and that i can do it alone or won't look at it alone and and have that that joy from it you know yeah you know? There's a great article that came out today in Medium. I, I, sh I should send it to you. I posted it on Facebook. But the whole article is exactly that, that mm -hmm. what this is exposing is that theater makers can't do their job. Right. It's, it's, showing, it's showing actually that we're on these rickety stilts uh -huh. that are proving that we have no government funding to sustain us. <laughs> and you have to be there and be live to do yeah. what we do. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And Absolutely. so maybe stop doing it. Is, that was what the article was saying. Was like, we just take a break. <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, I mean, we've talked about that a little bit because you know we've been we've been meeting with the board and Zoom meetings and everything, and there's been a discussion. Okay, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And you know, and we've talked about you know, do we do some online sort of content or whatever? But one of the things that we've all discussed is when we came together as a group, the thing that none of us we're doing was creating online content and it's kind of like saying to nike we can't make shoes right now why don't you try doing a restaurant you know what i mean and it's like right. i'm sure there are a few people right. who make a really good killer you know grilled cheese or something but as far as whether they can actually get a a, a restaurant running for a couple months before they go back to shoes i don't know so I, we've been really trying to find ways to spread joy keep art alive but not try to kid ourselves into thinking we can create something. That's not what we do. You know what I mean? We're not even very good at what we do. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of people would, would, uh, would like that. Um, what, yeah. um, you know, Fran, I never, I don't know if I've ever told you this, but you said something once in a rehearsal and we've done several things. So if I say this, no one will know what show it was. Um, <laughs> But you said something once in rehearsal, there was there was an actor that was kind of arguing with me about um, not wanting to play the given circumstances. And you just had like a very simple moment where you were like, well, you know, sometimes it's hard to play a character that we hate and we can't really play a character if we're judging them now, can we? So maybe we should play that, a character, play something that you may hate in yourself. And it was just, you said it with such joy and, and a kind of heart. You said it with such a kind of heart and everyone in the room was like, exactly right. Yes. And He's as we've learned, Fran hates himself very much. So it's easy for him to give that deep. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, and never mind. Self-hate <laughs> is just self-love spelled with slightly different words. <laughs> what, what um can you can you both tell me um can you reflect on something in your recent hit past history like in the past two or three years that you were really proud of as a theater maker or artist oh god <laughs> well i i have to say and i think i can say it fortunately because i wasn't in it so that i was absolutely absolutely moved and touched and so proud of american buffalo that uh, was done by um fran and uh richard and marcel and directed by rosina reynolds and the main reason i'll so go ahead and say the main reason i was so proud of that show um, I saw it every night because I was the person who I was in front, you know, and made, made the announcements, the exit speech announcements to the audience. And um, when Fran brought mentioned that show, I was like, oh, is that show about a bunch of guys and there's foul language and, um, you know, it's a lot of people like being angry at each other. And Fran's like, well, just read it. So I read it and um, I was like, Oh, I think maybe there's a deeper story in there. And I think that the story, I don't know if anybody is familiar and probably not a lot of people are, but there's a play called Orphans. And it's, oh, right. uh, yeah, it's about these two brothers who kidnap a mafia guy. And New Village Arts did it years ago with Fran, Jim Chovic, and Joshua Everett Johnson. And it was one of the most emotional plays I've ever seen. But in the creation of American Buffalo with Rosina and what they did with it, 
to me, it, mold, it morphed into a sort of orphan's piece of this family of men. And I don't think there are a lot of plays that really show men being rough and mean to one another, but their hearts are breaking inside. And I feel like um, also right now, there's a lot of negative sort of hashtag me too things about men. And um, I love seeing a play where I saw these men being this family despite each other and looking out for each other despite each other. And um, I saw people afterwards who were crying, who said, I don't know why I'm crying. And it wasn't done emotionally. It wasn't done with some sort of um, ridiculous take on it. It was done very honestly, very taking the, the text. And I just thought that they brought out the humanity in it. And I was incredibly proud of that production. I just thought it was beautifully done. and. And I wasn't in it. <laughs> and I didn't do that. You know, I can, reflect, <laughs> I can reflect on something. I, Jessica, I, I love you in abundance. I thought that production was really wonderful. Oh, thank you. That it was. Jackie Wilkie. See, that's, that's a perfect example of um, Brian Mackey, Jackie Wilkie, Fran, and I had gotten together to read a play that I had found that turned out to be terrible. I mean, it was terrible. We all sat there and like, literally like halfway through it, we were just sitting in the living room and we're like all like looking at each other like, this is terrible. I had thought, <laughs> I thought I liked it and then we read it and I was like, with these talented people, I can admit it's terrible. None of us are good at this. And then Jackie brought up, uh, she mentioned um, Abundance. And I said, oh, well, I'd love to see it. She handed it to me and I was like, oh my gosh, it's amazing. I'd never even read the piece. And um, that was a really lovely experience of just being with some friends in a room and, a, you know, what I was talking about earlier. And, and a, it, it inspired Jackie to mention a piece that she loved that she thought would be right for all of us. And uh, Anthony jumped in uh, to help direct it. And just the group of us working together, it just felt really like one of those magical things where it's just us working and enjoying a story and getting to tell this beautiful, fascinating, weird story. So thank you. I, I appreciate that you liked that show. I liked it too. Yeah. Very much. Yeah. What about you, Fran? Oh, shit. Uh, <laughs> the, um, I, God, I, um, okay, two things. Um, the, um, I was actually, this, no, we're gonna, that we're gonna sound just like a married couple. Oh, no. Is that, um, well, I think it was me who said, why don't we do experiment with an air pump again? I think I did that. I think I said that. When I had my first production company, that was the play that I had always wanted to do was experiment with an air pump. And we did it with Darren Scott and Ron Shalartin and Lauren, Lauren my, my partner, and a number of other people. And Joshua Everett Johnson was in it. Um, a lot of really talented people, but we did it in this crap little theater with no real sets and no real technical elements and we got lovely actually reviews that was like one of those things where all of a sudden we were starting to get some attention as this little tiny theater company and yeah. then it all disappeared <laughs> well okay uh that wasn't where i was going with it but uh, yeah yeah thank you um the uh now that you sabotaged my story ah <laughs> oh, marriage the, we're having uh, a good time yeah, we yeah. Left yeah. how much longer do we have the uh, <laughs> <laughs> the uh the the um but she but but i brought it up i said why don't why don't we uh, uh do why don't we take a look at that and um uh and richard the director um and i um richard totally on his own and me totally on my own it wasn't a team effort it was it was you know we were unaware that the that, that, that the two of us were doing this that um that we were encouraging jessica to consider, because we opened it up to auditions, but just to consider auditioning for the role of Isabel. And she was really hesitant to do it. She I had played it the first time, and it was about how many years later? At least 15 years later. Sure. So, so I was like, I don't know, you know, is it an age thing? Like she's, she's a maid, but she's also like part of what makes that story interesting is that the two sisters, the, the well-to-do sisters are looking for love. And so is she. So there's something that when the first time we did it, it almost had us all as peers. And all of a sudden I was like, well, now do I look like an old lady, pathetic lady looking for love? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, so the thing that, that, that is that, you know, a lot of, not a lot of times, oftentimes uh, actors will put on a brave face and say, oh, I love this role. I can't wait out. can't wait to get out there and do it. And it was, um, it was really inspiring to see uh, Jess um, really nervous 
and uh, battling with doubt through rehearsal and through the run of the show. And then, um, you know, just step out on stage. And I, you know, and I felt guilty for putting it, like we got halfway through the run when I started to feel guilty. I was like, ah, fuck. No, the, uh, um, but no, it, it, it's, I think that, 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 that was just, um, you know, I, I always love small, small acts of courage because I find them to be the most in, in, inspiring to me because that, that's the best I'm going to achieve, right? But my, my life is never going to be epic or heroic. Um, but the other thing that I'm really, really, I guess I would say that I'm fortunate about, that we're fortunate with, is that, is that the people that we've been able to work with, um, designers, stage managers, box office personnel, members of the board of directors, advisory, people who have helped us along the way, um, I'm just really, um, I don't know, it's, 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 it's incredibly touching, it's incredibly impactful that people will, um, will offer their, their, their guidance, will offer, offer their encouragement. And, um, I, you know, I'm thrilled um, with, you know, whether it be Joel Britt or whether it be Tony or whether it be Anna, working with Rosina, um, Kristen, who does our uh, house managing and box office, it's just, it, they're just a, it's good, a group of people. good group of people. And that's, that, that again is another thing that's so inspiring, encouraging. Can encouraging. I throw out one more real quick and I won't keep it. I, I have to mention Gutenberg, which oh. was our very first musical done by Tom Zohar and Anthony Metzvin. Mm -hmm. And it's a tongue in cheek take on these two guys pitching a musical on Johann Gutenberg and they do they would literally wear all the hats because they play all the I, characters. I still, I still have the other woman hat. Did you, oh yeah! Did you see it? Did you see uh -huh. it Robin? Yeah. I mean I, I that loved it. to me and we have it actually on video and um, you know just as our archival and sometimes I just watch it just to make myself happy because those two men and the work they did and their voices and their comedy and their what makes that play work to me is the earnestness of those characters really loving this terrible terrible story that they wrote with these stupid stupid songs and performing them with all their heart and um, none of the reviewers got it the, the reviewers absolutely oh. panned it called it I up. remember we I remember, told, I remember we were, one in particular. Yeah. Yes. We were told that it ruined everybody's August, that it literally uh -huh. ruined Theater Ogre's August. Mm -hmm. And I not only was proud of that show. Is there a second show, show? Is there a second show? No, it was our third. No, third. Sorry to fail, man. It was, not only was, uh, was, was I proud of the show itself, but when I watch it, I'm still like, I would want to go see that today. It's still as beautiful and gorgeously sung and funny. Uh, I was also proud of the way that <laughs> Anthony we've got dogs barking at us, that Anthony, Fran, and I dealt with it, which is, we never doubted that it was just us. It was our type of show. And that if they didn't get it, then they didn't get us. And that the, um, you know, Catherine Spangler was a dear friend of ours that we've met. We met her at Gutenberg and she and her family came like four times or something. And I was like, okay, we found one of our people. Like you just start finding who your people are. And so it didn't, it didn't really scare us. It, and I, I love that because a lot of people would have been like, well, I'm hanging up my hat because <laughs> everybody, you know, hated it. And we're like, no, because the people who loved it to this day are we, we didn't hang up our hats we auctioned off our <laughs> hats. <laughs> we did and you know just you did such a, a beautiful job of in the, of embracing that market as marketing and going <laughs> we're just gonna put it up everywhere <laughs> I know. I you want to see the show have... that ruined blah blah blah's August? Yeah, and then there were reviews like uh, Kim Strasberger <laughs> somehow. <laughs> but there were things like Kim has, Kim Strasberger somehow <laughs> made that happen, and then things like um, well they did that. Like it was like <laughs> it was like the reviews were like literally so bad but so funny to me because I'm like well that's exactly what that show is like what they didn't understand is the reviews that they were giving us were actually what that show was meant to kind of get it's like yeah they were this was a terrible musical that these guys were pitching and they did it so perfectly so yeah very proud of it yep it is interesting oh. <laughs> Anthony put a hat on yeah yeah the critic, yeah. well, you know, because there's like, I saw, I, I, I laughed my ass off when I saw Gutenberg. And then to read those reviews, I was like, this is the one you're going to come after? Right. <laughs> <laughs>
I mean, I'll put my own self in there. I'm like, I've done really bad worst shows. I mean, I've done, I've directed really bad shows, <laughs> and you've loved them. But they, you know, it's nice to be a critic's darling. But <laughs> we're not all. <laughs> it's, it's bizarre. Yeah. Um, will you? Uh, thank you for that laugh. Um, <laughs> what? Um, why do you think? Why do you think theater matters? Or like, do you feel the, the now that you feel the absence of it, what about it do you think is vital to society? Or is it? I don't know. I don't know. But I, 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 the reason why I say that is that, um, not to get too, God, I'm such a depressing guy. <laughs> but I, <laughs> I, I choke on myself. The, uh, I, I don't, oh, okay. Deep moments with Fran Gurk. I don't know that I matter, right? You live your life. And history says whether you matter or not, whether that's like, you know, the, the, the history that travels on for centuries, or it's the history of your family and, and your friends, the people that remember you. And um, I, I don't know if theater matters. I just don't know what else I'll do if I can't tell a story. I know I'll do something. I know I have to, right? Um, I'll figure it out. But and so I think that, you know, the, the, one of the more inspiring things um, is, um, I'm sure everybody says that they heard it first. I didn't hear it first. I heard somebody tell about it when they asked, um, I believe it was um, an elder of an Aboriginal tribe in Australia. They had this team of scientists together. I don't know, there was some conference somewhere, some conference that I wasn't invited to. And they, uh, they, 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 they asked this Aboriginal elder, what um, is the difference between humans and animals? And they're talking DNA, and they, so when they're trying to do the human genome, they're getting started on that. And, and, and the, uh, the elder just looked at the scientists, apparently, like, sort of, like, stunned. Like, the answer's so obvious. Maybe you need a refresher course. And he said, oh, that, that's easy. Um, humans tell stories. And that's the only thing, the only difference that the elder saw between animals and human beings. And I remember being a, not a kid, but being a younger man and hearing that and thinking, that's so true. Like you don't see a bunch of, you know, elk hanging out in the forest, like, oh, no, 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 I got one for you. <laughs> you know, and then they scatter when the humans show up, like, don't let them hear our stories, you know? How would we know? But, well, that's true. Okay, <laughs> she blew my theory. But, uh, but, the, but so it's, it's I, think that, I think that storytelling is essential. It finds its way um, because I think it's something that we do. I do think that comedy, is no fun on its own. So there, there's one way in which we all want to be in a room together laughing at the same joke, laughing at the same setup. There's something communal about that. And I think the same thing with um, uh, other forms of human experience is it's whether we care to admit it in our own personal lives or out loud is that when we're in a room with a bunch of like-minded people and, and the other thing that, that strikes me is that there's something magical about when everybody is in the same room, focused on the same thing. I mean, I, that, that to me is what is um, just, uh, I don't know. There's something, I, I don't know what the word, word is for it, but um, the, you know, I go crazy when I'm at, I go a little bit crazy when I'm trying to watch um, a movie with Jessica and either my phone will go, mm -mm, or her phone will go, mm -mm, and we'll have to get up and leave the room and you know, say, sorry, I got to take this or do whatever the case may be. Because I, I actually don't want to just watch this on my own. If I wanted to watch this on my own, I wouldn't have invited you into the room to watch it with me. If you're going to leave the room, stay the F out, right? <laughs> and so like, when, we're, when, we're in like a, when we're in like a theater environment, the, the, it's, it's one of the few environments other than an elevator where everybody knows the rules. Like in the elevator, nobody talks to each other, right? And you're sort of like, and if somebody does talk to you in an elevator, you're like, oh, Oh shit, get me out, whatever floor, I don't care. And, so, and, and like theater is the same way, is that there are uniform rules that we all follow and that accentuates the experience. So I just, I don't know how it's gonna change. It's gonna change. If I could predict the future, I'd be a really rich person and I'm not. So, um, the, so I, you know, anyway, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Awkward handoff. <laughs>
No, I think as far as uh, as theater goes, I, I have always said in regards to theater, I feel like um, it's such a heartbreaking art that if you can not do it, then don't do it. So I always feel like the people who really stick with it, it's because they literally can't not do it. So when you say, is it necessary? It is to the people that are doing it. It is, it's something they literally cannot help themselves. It, it's what they live and breathe to do. And so um, I think that what is important that we remember, and I know we all will through this, is how grateful we are for the people who want to sit there and hear our stories. Mm -hmm. So it's really the, the donors and the audiences that come out and support it and believe in hearing our stories that we owe so much to because we're going to keep doing it. You know, I mean, it's, it, it, it's something that we just can't live without. I work a full-time job that is so rewarding to me. I can't even tell you how rewarding it is to me. Every day I get up, sometimes I work, you know, seven days a week doing it, mm -hmm. but I can't stop doing theater. I can't stop doing it. I, it's just what I love so much. So yeah, I think it's necessary to the people that do it. And I think that we're necessarily grateful to the people who want to watch it and hear what we have to say. Beautiful. Do you think that, you know, when the doors reopen, whenever that is, you know, let's say July, August. Yikes. <laughs> uh, right? Is that, is that the reality? <laughs> Sounds like it. We just start crying. I know. <laughs> like, all right, go on. Ask your question. We got to move forward. Um, do you, what do you think? Do you think like, you know, you, you both mentioned like something about like, maybe the rules will be different. Well, what do you think, how do you think they'll shift? Or is it too hard to predict? I mean, the one thing that we've been talking a lot about, um, and this is a real serious concern, is right. when people are going to feel comfortable to go back into a group setting together. So we could say that, you know, some businesses are allowed to open in May, we very much know that I don't think there's going to be a single person who's going to want to. And, and <laughs> who was it that was saying, a friend of ours, Isabella, was saying, oh, yeah. what, is it, what is it about theater that makes people need to cough? They always have to cough in the theater. And now <laughs> when they do it, people are going to get Scatter. up. Yeah, they get up and leave. So um, it's to me, there's going to be this really hard transition. I hope not, but uh, I would predict that even once businesses start opening, it's gonna take a while to build up a theater audience that's comfortable to sit there in a group again. Um, and I'm hoping it doesn't take a long time, but it, it probably will. Um, but personally, I feel like the things that we are learning, like to be able to do uh, Zoom meetings and, and interviews and things like that from the comfort of our own home, we sure have had to move you know, rush forward into learning technology. So as far as running a business and, and theater is a business too, there are gonna be some positive things that come out of it just from the business standpoint. But as far as live theater, I think we're just gonna have to, to work to build up that audience again and get people healthy <laughs> and trusting that they're not gonna get sick from each other. It's like, I, I joke, this is horrible, but I joke because I, feel, I sort of feel like um, every business when the, the the quarantine is lifted and um, the um, infection curve has flatlined and um, hopefully um, the people aren't going through the trauma and the tragedy that they're going through right now. Um, it's just gonna be a little bit like the, trying to get people to come back into your business, whether it's a theater or a restaurant or yeah, a department store, it doesn't matter what. It's gonna be a little bit like the mayor of that town, Amity in Jaws. I'm like, go into the water, take a swim. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like <laughs> Ah, you know, <laughs> all right, let's take the grandkids yes. in, you know, <laughs> so it's, it's, I, I, but, but we also, you know, September 11th, 2001 happened and plane flying seemed to be the most dangerous thing in the world for a period of time. And then um, there are other, if you go, you know, back, there are um, um, many, many um, instances of uh, taking time, reaching the new normal and then um, experience uh, will show us how um, uh, challenging, how safe, how to practice that. Um, and then I think the other thing, the, the, another reality that has me a little um, concerned is um, what is going to happen in the fall. You know, there is this concern about, uh, you know, a double peak is not 
Mm -hmm. um, if, if the Spanish flu is any model, but that did occur. And so um, I think it's just, it, it, it's, it, I think it is just a matter of time. I think that's, and, and putting our best foot forward and making sure that um, precautions are taken. Yeah, I've been thinking a lot about, well, two things I've been thinking like Constantine asked in the seagull, like, what are the new forms mm -hmm. of theater? And how will this shift, you know, will will we as an audience want to participate more? Will we want more immersive things? Will we, will we want, and you know, will an audience want <laughs> So love? we don't have to be near each other. Yeah. Do we want love? Do we want like to be just entertained? Or will the audience want the opposite? Will they right. say, no, we, we've been sitting at home watching Netflix for that. We mm. want to be challenged and engaged Obviously, I think we all hope it's the latter, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't either. I, I, yeah, they, don't they say that following, I remember my mother telling me that right after World War II, the songs that were out were things like, how much is that doggy in the window? And all those, those were the songs that were mm -hmm. popular. And that it was, they were mm -hmm. looking for something light because it had been so heavy. Um, but you're right that theater also is the thing that, that tells our stories and for people who, I mean, we can only imagine how many COVID-19, you know, type plays there are going to be, you know, at some point, the same way that after 9-11, there were so many plays that came out about that tragedy, you know, it's people need to process, you know, what we were all going through. So yeah, probably a little bit of both. Mm. Yeah. Could you um, make some like we statements in solidarity with other theater makers? Like we need, you mean we are resilient, or oh. we are blank. So as opposed to a small statement, like a wee statement. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, 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 we will come out of this. We will come out of this. Yeah. Yeah. We try. We, we fail. Try. We try, we try we again. Fail. Yes. Uh, uh, um, and, um, but yeah, I, I, I think that, um, uh, I mean, I mean, the one that really, I think you, you said it earlier, like about 10 minutes ago, or maybe five minutes ago, where it's, it's, it's um, you know, we don't know, but we believe, you know, it, 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 the, the idea that um, it's, um, you know, I think that, I think that, that, that there's, that, you know, this is another thing. Okay, so I, I don't know what tradition this is in Native American culture. Um, and, uh, but there's, there's a, there's a tradition of rather, Heading forward. I apologize for my dog and the squeaky toy. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, that's definitely uh, we live that life. But the um, is that that we back into the future rather than heading forward into the future. And when you back into the future, anything that is in your way, in your, uh, any obstacle hits you in the back, and you don't necessarily know where you're going, but you know where you've been. And so, um, part of me. Um, when I start to worry about what is going on on the horizon, I just need to sort of orient myself and think maybe, maybe since there's no answer there, you know, focus on where I've been and trust that that is um, all the input and guidance that I need right now. And I, I will also say, um, we believe in what you're doing. We believe in the stories that you have to tell. Yeah. We know that they're important and, um, and we'll come out the other side. I think that those are important statements for all of us to remember. Yeah. 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 It's no. interesting as, as theater makers, like you said, you're just constantly, sometimes you're like in a play factory. You're like, I got to keep, you got to keep moving, keep producing, keep raising money, keep, yeah. right. keep going to those meetings, keep rehearsing. And we rarely get a chance to go like, wait, we're not really a machine. I think someone said that on a comment, like we're realizing that theater makers aren't a machine. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that giving yourself the time to pause, reflect, pat yourself on the back, maybe, you know? Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and, yeah. And, 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 and like you said, Jess, like, allow yourself to explore other forms of art. I, I think it's really important that we acknowledge that, that this online thing was not what any of us set out to do. So it's okay to give ourselves a respite and not try to, like you're saying, like frantically try to create something that isn't what we all 
specialize in. And I think it makes us feel like, oh, you know, we do some sort of a thing online and maybe it doesn't get as many listeners or followers. Or, well, that's okay. Like that's not, that's not our thing. And it's lovely that people are out there trying to provide content, but you don't have to be an expert at that. What you do is wonderful. And what you do is enough. And what you do will come back. Uh, we just have to give it time, you know? Yeah. Yeah. If, we, if there's any questions for these two lovely people, please ask them now. I saw that there was one, someone asked any advice on an actor to, to how does an actor hone their skills right now? I'm going to leave that to the teacher. You. You're a teacher. You're, you're me. <laughs> um, the, the, um, I, oh God, that's such a great question because it, isn't that the thing that this is such a, uh, it sounds like such a, unsatisfactory answer. But I think that um, going deep into the vault from, you know, a younger person's point of view, but I do think, you know, Uta Hagen with like, with respect for acting or a challenge for the actor, she really does provide a template. Because that's why she wrote that book, because she was, you know, sitting in her apartment, how do I practice when I'm not in a play? And, mm -hmm. um, and I do think that those, even though those exercises that she puts in there, might seem tedious. Um, they're really, really useful. Um, and um, they are fundamental to um, not only what you will do in telling a story live on stage, but also the way that you can train your mind to work, like the way anybody in any occupation, but I always think of athletes because I grew up playing sports, is that an athlete trains herself to stand a certain way before she does whatever she's gonna do with the ball or whatever the case might be. Um, and I, um, so I would say that because A, that book is respect for acting is so readily available. Um, and, um, and the other thing, it is so practical and so useful. And I think the other thing is that um, an another great thing that I um, found just really useful is um, anything, any source that talks about how a story is built, how a story is created, whether there's a big thick book that I found really inspiring, if not fun to read, only because it's like, it's like reading seven Bibles, it's big. It, um, but it's called um, The Seven Basic Plots and I find that to be a really, really useful resource because it says, and it essentially argues and pretty convincingly that there are only seven basic plots, which is a bit like a writer's okay. joke. And, um, and you can see it, uh, the, these plots across cultures that didn't cross pollinate. It's just human beings have come up with these seven basic plots and they stretch back millennia. Um, and that it's on a, at a cellular level that we respond to either patterns or deviations from those patterns. So it's not that you have to stick to the seven basic plots. It's that um, it lets you know what you're looking for. It's like when anybody, um, I remember sitting at a bar with a friend of mine and I was, I was trying to say, you know, what the hell is modern art? I don't understand it. What's the whole, and on a napkin, he drew the history of art in like four panes. Like if you, and I was like, oh my God, that makes so much sense. So now I know what I'm looking at when I look at and name, you know, the modern artist of your choice. Um, and then everything bounces off of, you know, that knowledge. So I think those are the two things, respect for acting and then anything that's about storytelling. And I'll say one other thing, because I, Fran comes from being a trained actor and he went to the actor's studio and, and um, I took acting classes and I was going to be a lawyer. So, um, which is a storyteller, I, which is a storyteller, but I, I didn't train as an, as an actor when I was in school. And so I took acting classes afterwards, but when got into law school, school, I decided I wanted to be, I loved, I'd always done plays and always been in acting classes and stuff. And I decided I wanted to be a theater actor. So I made a decision that every single day I was going to do one thing to become an actor. And that could include watching a fabulous movie with a, with a performance I heard was amazing and watching that actor 
reading a book, uh, an acting book, uh, doing a monologue that I had been wanting to brush up on. Um, I, but I gave myself the freedom or, or reading like uh, one of the books that Fran suggested. But I allowed myself just one day, do one thing, and it doesn't have to be performing or rehearsing or going to a class. It could literally be watching something and, and observing what it is about the storytelling of this one actor that I love so much and trying to, to figure out how I could put that into my own work. So I think that from a, a layperson's point of view, um, there are things we can do just when we're in quarantine and at home, we can still be watching and observing and learning from other actors. Yeah, absolutely. Deb Petri asked, if you could get the rights to any um, newish play right now, what would you love to get the rights for? Are you allowed to say that? Oh, that's an interesting question. You know, we do have one that we desperately are wanting to do. Um, oh! But we got the rights to it, so I'm not going to say it until uh, we announce it. So that's not fun. Okay. Why don't you come up with something? I do have one. <laughs> I do have one. that. Um, it, it, it's, I, I don't know how the hell we'll, we would ever be able to do it, is why I throw this out there. Mm. Um, and if you... Bad movie. Oh, we'll get to that question. Mm. The, um, but it's, a, it's, a, it's by the Burglars of Ham. Oh. From, uh, they're from L.A. I love it so much. Um, and um, it's um, Al, uh, uh, Albert Dayan, if anybody's familiar with him, is part of a writing group um, and a producing group called... They won like the a Hollywood Fest... Fringe Fest or something. Yeah, like they, 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 it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, it's, it's, now keep in mind, we're Brand the ones. performed it up in Sacramento. And we are the company that brought you Gutenberg. So, <laughs> so uh, but it's called, it's called The Behavior of Brodus. And I think it is uh, yeah. such a. Unique. Unique, well-crafted, quite honestly, beautiful, incredibly mm -hmm. timely story. Incredibly sure, timely. Yeah. Um, it's a uh, there. It's it, it it focuses on the story of um, John Brodus Watson, and um, he is among other things, you could say the architect of um, fear-based advertising, mm -hmm. which again, which then you know if you jump into and that was back in the fifties, sixties, and if you jump. Um, Nowadays, it's fear-based political campaigns. But he used a child very irresponsibly. He used a baby, an orphan baby, and a white mouse. To a white bunny. A white bunny? I thought he had the mouse that was always beside him singing. Well, that's Brodus. Anyway, I'll just <laughs> say, there's lots of singing animals in it. That's all I was going to Oh, yeah, <laughs> you're right. Yeah, the whole barnyard. Yeah, but, but it's a beautiful story, and it's funny, and it's odd, and it's quirky, and it tells a story I've never seen, and uh, Fran played Brodus in it. I went up and saw it up in Sacramento, and I saw it three times and wished I could have seen it a thousand more, and we'd love to do that. But it's a big cast, takes a, quite a, a large um, uh, musical section, so it's challenging in that sense yeah it sounds beautifully theatrical yeah it is it really is yeah. it's right up your alley it really is it's right up your alley <laughs> do you um um uh do you have any favorite playwrights or like a playwright if like they produce a new play you're like oh i have to read that um, we really love, um, you know, Smoke Fall was by um, Noah Heidel, Noah Heidel. Heidel and um, very unique playwright and very poetic and very, um, also your style of theater, Robbie, that I love so much, very um, taking kind of quirky, strange behaviors and making them somehow mean something or touch us, you know, in our hearts. Like when, because uh, Backyard Renaissance, the, the mission is art to the gut. And so it's that type of thing where you see something that doesn't match how we view the world. You see a, a the daughter of a family and she's eating dirt and, and rocks and, but it doesn't, look weird or uncomfortable it's like there's something about it that goes ah um i love playwrights that do stuff like that and i love playwrights that surprise me i, I just um uh jez butterworth is one of my very very favorites i just and i sat next to him one seat away from him um went and saw um the, oh, ferryman. the ferryman in new york it sat right next mm -hmm. to him and he even took a picture with me <laughs> and it was like one of those moments where i was just like oh my gosh um, and it, it, it was horrible. 
<laughs> he wasn't he wasn't he wasn't in town you know? i know but i could feel it across the country it's i could just feel the shock was going, to his going through her body but like, I mean Yay! Yay. <laughs> it was a strange way to end things. <laughs> yeah, very dramatic though. Yeah, we could have been dead. Yeah. We murdered each other and just cut it off. Which is exciting. <laughs> quarantine. Yeah. Quarantine. Uh, quarantine. Um, we'll answer that final question about what's your favorite bad movies. Oh. oh. Gosh, so many. I love Troll 2. Right? Yeah. I love Troll 2. And we did, you know, uh, we have our Unleashed series where we take professional, amazing, talented people and have them do, a, like, their honest to goodness, really try to perform it. Worst bad movie script that we can possibly find. So we did Troll 2, did Mommy Dearest, which is fabulous, Showgirls. Um, what, uh, the, the, I'll, I'll call it the granddaddy of them all. For, at least the thing that sort of, I think, got it started is that we were actually up uh, at Sean and Bill's. Sean about, and Bill's were staying, yeah, yeah staying when they, at their house. When they were, uh, they out were, of town. they were out of town. Um, and they, they don't know that we were there. I don't think yeah. so. This is probably going to get, yeah, I'm never going to be hired at Signet again, I can tell you that. Uh, but the, um, but uh, we were watching, it was Halloween, wasn't it Halloween? No, it was, um, Oh, was it on Halloween? It yes, on Halloween. and Tom Zohar was with us. Tom too. Zohar was with us. Yes, and um, and and Jonah was with us. Yes, and there was a movie on Turner Classic Movies, because I couldn't figure out how to work their TV, and so we were stuck on TCM, which is not a bad thing. Any TCM fans? I'm just saying <laughs> I couldn't maneuver. And this movie came on called Zat. Z A A T. Yeah. And if you ever have a chance to watch Zat, it's terrible. <laughs> in such a beautiful way. You can't stop watching. It's the best. And there's, uh, I won't, I don't want to. Black and white. No, color. Are you sure? <laughs> it just, your mind oh, shut down God. and you remember it only in black and white. <laughs> but there's like, I mean, it goes, they're, they've got, they've got um, uh, uh, basically the Loch Ness Monster. No, not the Loch Ness Monster. Creature from the Black Lagoon yeah, is basically, basically in it. Um, it takes place in some weird, um, uh, Florida, uh, 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 like golf course. I mean, this is all like they were just like guerrilla filmmaking this thing. Mm -hmm. And in the middle, there's like this um, '70s flower power music video that breaks out, and um, it's it's absolutely um, you just you, you. This is what he looks like. Oh, can you see it? That's his face. Yeah. Zat. 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 And we, it was so bad that we started saying, when we were talking about movies, we would say, well, is it Zat bad? Because <laughs> <laughs> if it was Zat bad, then we knew we'd like it. Then we have a winner. Then we have a winner. <laughs> so yeah, so that, that started it for us. Yeah, yeah. it was yeah. just, and, 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 and it was tough because I think that shortly thereafter, after that movie ended, then like TCM went with a legit sort of Halloween yeah. fair. So disappointed. So disappointed. Like <laughs> after that, like Halloween, the original doesn't really compare. Not because it's not that bad. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, yeah, they're, they're, so, so that's, that's my favorite, favorite bad movie of all time. But the real, I, honestly, the real- Tom re Zohar is always with us. Yeah, Tom Zohar is always with us. Um, yeah, is, is that Anthony and Tom, Anthony Methvin, our producing director, is- um, A genius. Yeah, he really is. Oh. He really he, he has some things lined up. Yeah, he's got some stuff coming and it is unbelievable. And I'll say to him, he'll show me a bad movie and I'm like, where did you find that? Just kind of- you can't give away the magic. No, no, yeah. yeah. So, if anybody's looking for a bad movie, he's the person to contact. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, well, I love you both. I love, yeah, you, I love you, Robbie. I can... hope I can see you soon and we can yes. collaborate on something. Real, real honest face to face, but this has been nice. Yeah. And I want to order that book. What is it? Is it called Seven Basic Plots? Yeah, The Seven Basic Plots. I think you'll enjoy it very much. I will. All right. One more. We'll see thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, thank Bye, you. Bye-bye. Thank you.